The intersection of courage and bravery often intersect when you're searching for a reason to persevere, when the obstacles of your life inevitably get in the way of tangible progress. In America today, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it's estimated that at least one in seven children have experienced child abuse or neglect within the past year. It's also fair to assume that this would be an underestimate because many child abuse cases go unreported. For Carrie Kelly, she has a powerful story of resilience, perseverance, and overcoming adversity. She has a profound story of both resilience and hope as a victim of child abuse herself. She's interested in moving the needle of progress forward and creating a space where children who have been abused have a safe place to land and really understand that they still have a viable future ahead and they can write the narrative of their own story and serve as an agent of hope resilience, and prosperity. Kelly is a speaker, an international best-selling author, and fierce advocate to ensure that all children can pave a pathway towards success with a meaningful trajectory forward in order to become a full and valued member of society at large. This conversation with Kelly was revealing, thought-provoking, emotional, and full of transparent ways we can all contribute to the voices of children, no matter their upbringing or experience, to ensure that they all have a shot at living a life of dignity respect, and honor. Without further delay, I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. take a moment to welcome you to the program and I'm super excited to learn about uh, the important work you do uh, sur- surrounding uh, child uh, abuse prevention. Great to see you this afternoon and thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, Carrie, I'm wondering if we can start our conversation by you just giving me a more broader general sense of of why uh, uh, child abuse uh, advocacy is sort of your passion and purpose in life. Why is it so important to you? Okay, first let me start with the fact that I am an adult survivor of childhood abuse. I am legally blind because of an injury that happened when I was only 14 months old. I was 14 months old in the process of being adopted by a woman who decided that I did not like her because every time she came near me, I would cry. And so um, she, in her frustration one day, she shook me. And while she is shaking me, she smacked my head against the wall and fluid built up on my brain. I didn't get medical attention for 10 whole days, okay? 
So for a child that is less than two years old, the statistics say that I should be either completely blind or I should be a vegetable with a lot of brain damage or I should have not lived through either one of those injuries. So that happened when I was only 14 months old and I am 53 now. So there's that. The second part of this is that I got adopted into another family once I was removed from the first family. And this family has generational abuse where there were people who understood that the new family I was being adopted into was not going to be safe for me, but they didn't speak up. It wasn't until I was all grown up that I was asking questions that I found out that people were uncomfortable with me being adopted into this new family, but they didn't know what to say or what to do to keep me safe. So that more than anything else, that right there is why child abuse prevention is so important to me. And it's more important for me to speak to the people that are not already working on child abuse prevention, because the people that knew I was in harm's way were not in the space. They were nurses, they were um, 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 office workers and, and, you know, people that were just going about their lives, trying to take care of their family. And, and um, they didn't know what to do. So I'm here to do two things. Number one, show the adult survivor that it is possible to have a beautiful life after abuse. And the second thing is I'm here to offer resilience and resources to things, to people so that if something is coming up, if a child is in harm's way, there's a resource and a resilient way to manage that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Carrie, I, I, just learning about your story, I, I'm fascinated as to your uh, concept or view of the concept of resilience and perseverance and how you view view those two things and whether you think they're interconnected. Um, you know what? <laughs> I think I was created for this. I will, I, I'm going to just say the truth. I think my head was just a little bit harder so that when it got smacked, um, it didn't break. My body was just a little bit stronger. So when I got shaken, all I lost was some of my eyesight. Now I have enough eyesight to get in trouble, but not enough to get a driver's license. Good trouble and though, right? I have seen the way some people with normal eyesight drive, and I could drive just as bad. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I know it's important to build a sense of community and a community of resources for uh, uh, young, young people and those working within the space and those that don't work in the space. So tell me about the importance of building a sense of community and what sort of uh, resources are available for the, uh, those who may be going through uh, this unfortunate situation. Okay, well, for the, the, the people that need to make reports, um, depending on where you are, I have two resources right off the top. The first one is if you live in the U.S., there is um, the Child Abuse Prevention Hotline, and that number is 1-800-4-A-CHILD. And if you live outside of the United States, the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children, their website is icmec.org. So those are the two resources that are available if you need to report things. Now, the other piece of this is that for the adult survivor who is looking for a level of healing, it is possible to find it. 
there is a light within that you have to focus on. There is the thing that whatever brings you joy, you focus on that. Um, I also found a definition of forgiveness that helps keep the ball in your court so that you can decide how much you hurt and suffer. So the definition that I use for forgiveness is for me to choose to hurt and suffer less, even though I am wounded. Now, that definition puts the ball in your court. And the way I handle it is when I wake up feeling really bad and angry about all the abuse that I went through, I choose to find a way to move that scale. I put it on the scale from one to 10. Well, how sad am I? How angry am I? And how long do I want to be like this? And I start to say, okay, I'm going to choose to hurt and suffer less by watching stand-up comedy or reading something funny or playing with um, my grandson or my granddaughter. I have grandchildren now. Even though I never had children of my own, I still have grandchildren. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, how I met my husband and he already had kids and his kids are the ones that um, got married. And now I have four beautiful grandchildren. And that's the other thing that keeps me going because I need to keep them safe. I need to keep them safe. And I don't know where they're going to end up in life. But if they end up in the school or in the workplace or in the college dealing with people that have been abused and they have not had their healing, that's going to have an effect on my grandchildren because my grandchildren are sharing that space. They're in the same class. They're in the same workplace. They're in the same office. And those unhealed wounds have an effect on how those people deal with other people. You hear the saying all the time, hurt people, hurt other people. And it's it also goes the other way. Healed people help heal other people. So that's my other goal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Harry, I knew that you had uh, grandchildren because I watched one of your uh, speeches about uh, how you uh, got uh, grandchildren, so I knew that about you. And so tell me about your definition of uh, raising or taking a village to raise a child, because I know that you have a unique perspective on that. So I, I'm wondering your, your thoughts on, on the importance of uh, surrounding children with a uh, positive uh, village to ensure that they can reach their fullest potential? Well, it's going to start with a lot of trust. And some of that trust is your own inner knowledge, your own inner voice, your own uh, inner guidance. For example, um, if the if there are certain people who say they want um, my grandchildren to come and spend the night, over their house, right? And if I don't feel comfortable about it, because I am not the parent, I don't get to say, no, don't let them go. If the parents decide that it's okay, then I have to be okay with that. But if I'm not, I have trusted a source that handles things on the level that is bigger and stronger than I am. So, Case in point, there was a time when they were going to go visit somebody and inside me, I was like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. And so I, I trusted what was inside of me and I just knew that they were not going to be able to go and visit. So what happened was the kids were all waiting. They thought they were going somewhere and the people that were supposed to come and pick them up, the car wouldn't start. OK, so, oh, we'll have to do it another day. It, you know, we need a rain check. And, and that was me asking for protection 
of my grandchildren because I did not feel good. So everybody needs to be able, they have to be a trusted member of the, of the village, right? And when you have a village big enough, sometimes there's people that are not trusted in the village. And now what I need for people to understand is that if you know that there's a person in the village that can't be trusted, you rally around the people that cannot protect themselves. You don't rally around the untrusted people in the village. And that takes some finesse, but it can be done. We can have that conversation too, but you know, it can be done. For example, if that person lives at a certain place and there's other folks that are trusted in the village, then that trusted person gets to come visit the kids over here. You don't take those kids to the house where there's a person living that in that house that cannot be trusted in the village around the children. Okay, so that's how we navigate around that. So my whole thing is putting um, ideas in the community, in the village to keep the children safe. So that's one way. There's more, but that's the, that's the best way for now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Terry, I know that you're multi-talented because you're the creator and producer of your own one-woman show. So I'm wondering if you can tell me all, of, all about uh, uh, what makes uh, uh, you have such a powerful pre presence on stage. And tell me about those shows themselves. I'm fascinated. So <laughs> it's it's so funny because the way that that is a journey that happened because of back in I think 2014 when there was a huge scandal with the Catholic Church and everything was coming out about all the abuse happening in the Catholic Church and when people were talking about how um, you know, the Catholic Church was so worried about their reputation and how it would affect their ability to do the work, the good work that they were doing. I was angry about how nobody was talking about the effect that that abuse had on all the children. So my first show, Somebody Else's Child, was a result of that. I said, let me give people a front row seat of what a child that is being abused will go through. So I got on stage as my four-year-old self going through abuse, eight-year-old self going through abuse, 12, 16. And then I portrayed my adult self trying to navigate all of the um, wounds that I dealt with. And so I put on the, the, the blue coat as the depression where I just laid down and said, oh, I just want to die. And then I put on the red coat and I'm angry, angry, angry. And I'm yelling and screaming and stomping around the stage. Um, and then I put on the yellow, which is this seeking healing. Like I need to seek some kind of healing so that I'm not angry and I'm not depressed. And at the end of it, I put on this green um, outfit. It's like this voluminous, angelic looking green outfit where I'm, you know, I'm growing through the process. Green means growth. And, you know, so I did that. And, um, and that was the first one. The second um, three chairs was um, an idea that I got from a comedian where he did different voices for each mic that he stood in front of. He set up three mics on his stage. One was for one-liners, one was for whole story jokes, and the other one was for his vulnerable uh, 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 stories. And so I did that with my three, I did three chairs. Every time I sat in a different chair, I was a different person. Um, sometimes I was the, the, the abusive people in the chair. Sometimes I was my victim self. And the other time I was the healed, whole, and complete person. That was three chairs. And 
From Garbage to Gold is the last one I just did. And um, that one is telling my story, com comparing and contrasting between, at the time, my three grandchildren, three granddaughters, for when they came to live with us and how old they were and how we connected and the things that we had in common and all the things that I was going through when I was the ages that they were. And then I put on a garbage bag and talked about how I wanna throw my life away because it was no better than the garbage. And there was a light that never went all the way out even though it was very, very weak. And um, I, I demonstrate focusing on that light. And then I make that light stronger and stronger until I rip the garbage bag off and I'm wearing this golden outfit. And that is the story of from garbage to gold. Now I will put a bug in everyone's ear that there will be an upgraded show coming because now I have four grandchildren and I am now an international best-selling author. So I went from garbage to gold and now I'm going from gold to platinum. And that's the next show that I'm going to do from gold to platinum. Well, I, I wish you all the best of luck with those shows. It's you're uh, certainly someone that is an ally in the fight against child abuse. Uh, Terry, I'm curious to ask you also about how do, you, how do you think we can continue to make tangible progress in reducing the frequency of child abuse? What do you think the key is there? Um, well, the first, very first thing is that if people see something, they, they need to speak up. And if they know something, they need to do something. So if we can start there, that would reduce a whole significant level of it. Because from my own experience, there were countless people that knew I was in harm's way. And if one of them, maybe just one, has spoken up, my life would look a lot different, okay? But there's that. Now, there also is that dynamic for the people that do speak up, okay? They need support as well because sometimes when you're the only one speaking up and everybody else turns their back on you because they don't want to address it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want you talking about it. You know that whole thing of what goes on in this house stays in this house. Mm -hmm. And that's how the generational abuse can continue and continue because nobody's speaking. And if somebody does, they get ostracized and, and people like will, will turn their back and it gets really ugly. But if that person had a network of folks that could support them through it, I think more people would speak up. So we need to find ways to support those who do stand up, give resources and healing for the abuse that has already happened so that people can find the healing that they need. And there's just, there's enough work to go around. It's just a matter of people stepping up to do it. You know, like that starfish story. The, I don't know if you've seen that starfish story from Chicken Soup for the Soul, mm -hmm. where the beach is just covered with starfish. And there's two people looking at this beach full of starfish. One of them decides, oh, my gosh, there's so much work. There's just too much work. There's no point in trying to do any of this. All of these starfish are just going to die. And then the other one decides to pick up the starfish and put it back in the water. They pick up another one, put it back in the water. And the other person is still, you know, saying, oh, it's not, not going to matter. It's not going to matter. But for every starfish you pick up and put back in the water, it matters to that one. Okay. So, like, if I was one of the starfish that was on the beach, 
when one peop one person was busy looking at all these starfish, somebody picked me up and threw me back in the water. And now I mattered to that person. And now it matters to me. Every person, every child that can be saved and pulled out of harm's way because of me sharing my story matters to me. Every adult survivor that will grab a hold of some hope and some resilience because I'm sharing my story of hope and resilience, that one matters to me. Absolutely. And, you know, you, uh, Terry, you, you segued nicely into my, my next question because I'm also uh, wondering your perspective on whether you think uh, compassion and action uh, can be interwoven uh, to uh, motivate people to take action against child abuse. Do you think those two things can be linked at all in the fight against uh, child abuse? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when you have enough compassion to see and feel the pain of someone else, it will move you to take action. It will. And that's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's just that simple. If you can see and feel the pain of someone else, it will move you to action. Um, I'm not really sure that empowerment is, is, is part of um, what I, I believe in because empowerment feels like a, a buzzword to me these days. You know, like, um, it, it, I, I'm more interested in the actions that people are willing to take to do the work that needs to be done. And when you get, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When, when, when you, 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 you deal with empowerment, it feels to me like empowerment is something that is all about keeping people happy and, and, and let's keep smiling through the bad times and let's just keep, you know, focus on the happy and focus on the good and not talk about, you know, um, the hard stuff not talk about, you know, um, the journey of healing and how, you know, you, 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 you can appreciate the rain um, because now you know what it's like when the sun comes out. And empowerment, it has its place. It does have its place. But I, I, I'm, I'm more interested in folks who are moved to action. And if it takes empowerment to get that happening, then yes, let's do empowerment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, Terry, I'm also wondering how you view the concept of acceptance and inclusion and really uh, making sure that, that uh, the people that are interested in doing this work and the people that are interested in advocating on behalf of children children make sure that they're doing it from a lens of acceptance, healing, and inclusion. I'm wondering your thoughts there. So acceptance and inclusion is, is, is part of it. And if you um, are going to have an issue being accepting about, you know, which child, who, which children you help and how you um, show up, then there, there's something going on with the motives, you know, like you're, you're doing this to get something out of it. And like, for, for me, it's more about like, I will never know all of the people that I can help by sharing my story or doing my one woman shows or publishing a book, but I'm compelled to do it 
And it's not always the easiest thing to keep doing this, right? And so um, how what keeps me going and what keeps me showing up is all those stories that come to me when somebody says, you know what, I, I heard your story and I think my next door neighbor is, is, is abusive to their children. And I, I heard your story, so I, I did something. Um, or, or, you know, I'm an adult survivor as well. And um, thank you for sharing your story because now it helps me to come to terms with my stuff. So like, I, I, I keep showing up because I know that I need to. But if you're showing up and you don't get that recognition, the name and, you know, your name and lights and, and like all over, you know, uh, uh, the recognition, oh, good for you. You're doing this. You're good. You know, it's, it's going to be hollow. It's going to be hollow. And you're not going to be able to keep going when the times get tough. You know, like if all you want is, is is some kind of recognition for the work you're doing, if you never get a phone call or any kind of kudos about what you're doing here, then you're not going to be able to keep it going. Um, it's not easy to sit and tell my whole story about being abused. And every time I have to do it, I come away sometimes where I don't want to do this anymore. And, and, and like, sometimes I don't even want to get out of bed when I know that I have a speech or a, co or a, a podcast or some kind of thing that I have to do where I got to tell my story and, and, and show up for it. It's not easy. And if all I wanted out of this was some kind of recognition, name recognition, oh, you know, oh, you're doing such good work, this and that, and the other thing. I would have stopped a long time ago. Yeah, it's about uh, paying it forward. And, and Carrie, I have to tell you, you've done a terrific job of sharing your story with me today. And as we um, end our conversation today, Carrie, I'm curious to uh, end our conversation with, with your uh, final message of hope and resilience. and. Finally, tell me uh, how, how people can get through uh, times of a struggle with a glimmer of hope at the end of a rainbow. It's all about keep breathing. It's, it's as simple as that. If you're still on this side of the dirt, keep breathing. It means that you still have life. And as long as you still have life, you still have choice. And you can use that choice and that time to focus on the bad or be angry and bitter. But there is a saying about that. You holding on to bitterness is for you to drink poison expecting somebody else to die, okay? So that's what holding on to bitterness will do for your life. And I say, find the thing that helps you keep breathing. And sometimes all it is, is putting your hand on your heart to feel the breath. And you focus on that until you can appreciate that you are still alive. And the very next thing you do is your choice. Now, let me tell you, truthfully, sometimes my choice is to stay in the bed. <laughs> I will stay there until I have enough energy and motivation to get up. And sometimes what will give me that energy and motivation is something very tiny, like when my little grandson comes in and he's got him his little self and he's doing his little one-year-old thing, I go, I got to keep it moving because he's got to grow up in this world. And if I do my part to make it better for him, then I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So that's what I can leave you with. 
for in terms of hope and how to hold on when times get tight and rough. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so very much for uh, sharing that, Terry. And tell me, uh, finally, if people want to get connected with you, what's the best way they can do that? I am on Facebook at Carrie Kelly, Instagram, Resilience with Carrie, Twitter, Carry On K2. <laughs> um, my um, website is voicesofresilience.com, and you can connect directly to me through there through my email, Carrie at voicesofresilience.com. Well, fabulous, Carrie. I want to. I commend you for uh, your story of courage and perseverance and for sharing it with me this afternoon. It's most appreciated. You're certainly an uh, inspiration to so many people of alive hope and uh, courage, my friend. And I want to thank you so very much for uh, trusting me to help share your story and for joining me this afternoon. It's most appreciated. Thank you so much for having me.